Tales of Ogar Lost Descendants is a turn-based RPG heavily inspired by JRPGs, while also being reminiscent of the Shining Force games when it comes to some plot points as well as a mechanic we'll get into later. We follow the story of two brothers, princes named Askin and Glenn, as well as their friend, a powerful healer named Jane as they make new friends, build an army, and prepare to retake their kingdom from the evil grasp of the mad magician turned tyrannical ruler, King Alistar. In order to build up our forces, we are forced, see what I did there, to traverse an open world on foot as well as on horseback. During our travels, we encounter many different settings from lush greenery, perfectly illuminated by the sun's glow, to the dark dreary and frightening caves and mines only seen through the light of a lantern. Every setting is fully realized, meticulously crafted, with some phenomenal lighting and atmosphere. Also adding to said atmosphere is the music. The tracks are really good as well as how they are used, expertly adding emotion to the scenes that accompany them. That being said, the music is also limited so expect to hear the same ones based on the tone of the situation, which made it even more imperative that they're easy to listen to, and thankfully they are. They got it right. I'd even listen outside of the game if we're being honest. In fact, the music you can hear in the background right now is from this game, and I will put credit where it is due in the description. The other sound effects are serviceable for what they are. Nothing really stuck out as spectacularly good or glaringly bad, but in this case, that's a good thing. They don't detract from the story in the moments they are a part of, and they don't break from the immersion either. Since we're already talking about sound, I do have to mention, there is no voice acting. Just like a lot of the old traditional RPGs, your story is given by dialogue, through text. There aren't any cinematic cutscenes either, not in the sense you would think of now. Which helps keep the flow and makes the world feel more immersive since you're constantly seeing the same thing. Also, keeping with that immersion is how the world changes with your actions. Remember how I brought up Shining Force? Well, in that game, the characters have a hideout of sorts where we equip our troops, speak to them, etc. Here, we have a homage to that. I think it was literally called a hideout, and whenever you recruit new members, they will show up there. Parts of the hideout will start to be used. The people in it will grow in energy. Everything will start to feel more full of life as well as the hideout being expanded on what it can be used for. For example, you can get a blacksmith and that can lead you to being able to buy weapons from him. Get a carpenter and he'll start making ladders. An old war veteran and he'll start training troops. It's a very rewarding system that makes everything feel more important. I brought up gear, which is very important to equip. Due to the nature of the leveling system, the game doesn't have grind. No random mobs to fight, or spontaneous encounters to deal with. You level up with the pace of the story, and although it does scale everything to a casual player, I found it extremely refreshing. That being said, that approach did have its issues. For example, fighting what would typically be considered a weak enemy could make it seem like a sponge soaking up damage in this one. A rat or a bee are weak enemies in most media, normally reserved for the beginnings of games, but not as a means of a real challenge. In this game though, 
you can play for hours and then encounter another bee that's the same amount of an issue as it was when you originally encountered it. That brings up another issue I had, a lack of enemy variety as a whole, even in settings that are primed for a switch up. For example, I'm in a foggy, bogged down place filled with human remains outside of a tower in which a witch lives. Skeletons made from the fallen familiars that the witch could have, or heck, even the servants she brings up later could have all been used to add a deeper layer to this encounter and make it stand out, but they don't. We get bees again. There are other moments, but I think you get the idea. Thankfully though, in the grand scheme of things, it's not too distracting due to how well the story itself is executed and as well as how well the characters, for the most part anyway, are developed. I'm going to give the characters a benefit of the doubt though since I haven't finished the game and avoid the spoilers that I have a problem with and instead finally go into combat in general. It's turn-based combat, you choose the actions of your characters as the enemies do the same and then you watch it play out. Which side and which character that takes the initiative may be based on agility due to Glenn having the most and always going first, but due to the lack of the way to grind levels and the stats going up automatically, they are kind of meaningless. Once you figure out whose stats are what, they will always have the lead in those stats and you can always plan with that in mind even with the equipment. Askin is a black mage. He uses attacks like fire, water, ice, lightning, etc. in order to deal damage. Some enemies have vulnerabilities, but not normally the human ones, which leaves me to lobbing whatever element I feel like at him until they die. June is a support class, white mage, and she's only good for healing, restoration, and buffing as of right now. She has a basic attack, but against most enemies, it's basically pointless. Against what her abilities could do to heal us. She'll never do a lot of damage, but there's literally moments when it does zero. Glenn is a swordsman. He's the wielder of the katana. He has attacks that really reflect that. One that slices the enemy multiple times, a powerful slice that lowers defense, I just unlocked some kind of jump attack where he jumps in the air for a whole turn, he can't get attacked, and then he comes down with a big slice. You get the idea. His blade can cause cuts, which causes bleed over time, but his defense is rather low by default, so he definitely shouldn't be used to tank any damage. In fact, I've never encountered a character yet that can be used for a tank for our side, and it doesn't seem like we're going to either, given the largest number of enemies we've went against so far is three. That being said, each of the character's classes represent them in some way as well. Askin is a dark mage, same as the main antagonist, and due to that, gets Super Saiyan-esque power-ups whenever he's angry. That shows his darkness that's inside of him that he's battling, just as Alistar once did. His varied number of attacks also showcases his ability to make decisions, and as next in line to the throne, his ability to rule. June's class shows her kind-hearted nature, her supporting and loving personality, as well as her willingness to fight regardless of her strength, which is perfectly represented with her basic attack. Glenn's shows his prowess with a sword, mastering it with multiple attacks, while also due to a katana being easily broken when clashing blades makes sense for his lower defense. It also shows that although he has a cool persona, just like the blade, there's a hint of fragility there. When it comes to the enemies though, I haven't noticed the same nuances, but I also haven't had any reoccurring named enemies either. Besides Alistar, the enemies are nameless. Even mercenaries we encounter numerous times, the same three dad blame people lack identification as of where I'm at in the story right now, which makes it a little harder to grow to be like, <gasps> not you again, like our heroes do. Especially since we were with the mercenaries for a long time at one point, and there's no way they never said each other's name at least once. I'm hoping this is rectified as the game progresses for my immersion's sake. 
also bringing up immersion in the uh, port city we were in the same exact merchants picture is for every single shop again these are small nitpicks that don't really affect the gameplay or the game as a whole but it's noticeable nonetheless i've also noticed some puzzles and mini games here and there there was a uh, a mural where i could take rocks from tombs and put it in and summon something from it there was a uh, mini game when you first get your horse where you gotta click certain keys on the keyboard i was trying to do ones that didn't quite work right not the ones they were telling me to do but i mean i did get a jump out of it you know i could get a response out of that mini game hitting the wrong button so i don't know if it was originally programmed with both ways in mind but only one ended up working they do a good job to switch things up every once in a while they don't necessarily break the flow too much that they feel out of place and i did kind to find them a little bit fun it's interesting to go to a place and know you can do something but you don't have to like that rock puzzle was i mean you could have probably just completely avoided it and the game would have kept going makes me wonder what else i might skip out on or might have already skipped on now as a completionist that may be an issue for you <laughs> Steam doesn't have any achievements for this game, so if you wanted to see if you missed anything while you're going through it by looking at achievements and being like, wait, I never activated this or did this, then that's not gonna happen. Doesn't exist, it's not gonna work. That is quite a problem for me, I ain't gonna lie. I'm a big trophy hunter, I'm a big achievement guy, I like getting 100% if I enjoy the game. And I really enjoyed this one. Final verdict, and it sucks that I'm not gonna be able to have achievements to show for it. I really do recommend this game to anybody that is a JRPG, like the graphical style of the old games and your nostalgia button's just getting beeped every time you look at it and you just need a game like that to play. The plot is really fleshed out, it is engaging, it is intriguing, it does a lot to try to keep you with the game to keep you wanting to see what's next. The characters are really well developed. I only had two crashes going through one door at one cave. I don't know what that was about. Probably my computer, but other than that, I have had zero issues with this game whatsoever. The game has multiple manual saves, which is nice. I don't know why more games don't have that, but it has no auto save, so keep that in mind. The combat is fun, it's fluid, some of the enemies being more spongy does break with the flow a little bit. Ultimately, it doesn't detract from the rest of the experience. There's a lot to love here and it is blatantly obvious that there's a lot of love put into it. Everything feels lovingly made, you know what I mean? It's one of those things when you play it and you can feel the heart and you can feel the passion of the person behind it. And you don't get that with a lot of AAA games anymore. Or even AA games that used to have passion, that used to have heart like Blood Bowl 3 that I'll link up there in the corner. It doesn't feel corporate, there's not a lot of padding. The grinding is taken out as an example of not a lot of padding. You can't even grind for senseless hours because every hour has some meaning, something that matters. Even the side quests matter. <laughs> everything does it is important it is imperative and if it's not it's not in there so far take that from a guy that's played it for quite a bit of hours okay it's a fun game and i definitely recommend it if steam achievements are ever integrated i don't know if you can do that like patch it in like playstation does but if so i will definitely make another review where i get all of them it'll be a back after plat but no platinum so <laughs> A back after Steam sounds stupid though, so we're keeping it with Back After Plat, which is a series I've been wanting to start for a while now. I also want to point out that this is from a one-man development team. One guy spent years of hard work making this game, and it's honestly inspiring. He put on somewhere, I think it was on Steam, that it took him a while to be able to accept criticism for his writing, and if he accepted it and made this masterpiece, then I... Pff, more power to him, that is amazing. It is honestly really impressive that he made such a good quality game by himself over the course of years. It shows the kind of person that is behind this and it shows where the heart is coming from, the heart behind the game. So yeah, give it a gander. If you made it this far, I appreciate you. For more news, reviews, and whatever we choose, stay tuned, subscribe. I'd love to talk to you about JRPGs in the comments if you got any questions, concerns, recommendations. That's a big one I'd like. And thank you to the developer for giving me a review code. I'd say your name, but I'd butcher the heck out of it. But know that that meant the absolute world to me. So thank you. But like always, everybody. 
Have a great day.